but some very clever scientists decided to illuminate the backdrop. And that was a kind of a eureka moment, I think, for the field because we started looking in all the tissues and realizing when immune cells are crawling around any tissue, they're not crawling around in a black space or in an empty space. They're actually crawling on the connective tissue. I'm Jane Grogan, and I'm a scientist. I've been at this for more than 20 years now, and I think perhaps the only thing better than doing science is talking about the science. Lucky for me, I work in a place where I am surrounded by some of the brightest minds in research. However, there's usually not much time to just sit and talk. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be hosting this podcast. I'm going to step away from my lab today and chat with a colleague about some of the cool stuff we're working on, especially as we try to link these discoveries to new medicines. So grab your favorite drink, get ready to unlock your science brain and join us for Two Scientists Walk Into a Bar a podcast for biotech geeks and the people who want to hang out with them. Do you know what connective tissue is? Yes. Yes. I know what connective tissue is. OK, then. But do you know what connective tissue does? It, it, connects, your, um, your, it connects your organs and your bones. Your organs your... and your guts together. Uh, at a basic level. Uh, I thought connective tissue connects like muscle to the bone. And that's what I think it is. On this podcast, we've talked a lot about different kinds of cells and what they do. Immune cells, brain cells, cancer cells. But there's a whole universe of connective tissue that helps these cells to move, talk and interact with one another. For a long time, no one paid attention to this connective tissue. Now that's all changing. We're learning how important connective tissue is. To get a sense of where the field is going and what this means, I'm sitting down with the lead scientist in the field, Shannon Turley. So welcome, Shannon. So as you know, I'm an immunologist and I work on immune cells. And as we know, and we've talked about in other podcasts, these immune cells need to move around to pick up instructions, interact with other cells, head back to infected or diseased tissues. And it's, it's well defined that these cells use the bloodstream and lymphatics to do that. So it turns out that connective tissue is critical for this process as well. So what is connective tissue? Well, connective tissue is the material that holds, holds organs and tissues together and gives the cells in those organs and those tissues that carry out specialized functions like liver cells or lung cells. Liver cells help detoxify the blood. Lung cells help absorb you know, oxygen from the air. It gives those cells support or structure to carry out their important functions. Your organs couldn't exist without the connective tissue support. I mean, I think about it a little bit as a matrix or, or a nest even. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. I like the nest idea. Jane. Hi, Wellington. That's my producer. So to clarify, it almost sounds like connective tissue is its own organ? Yes, it is. But it's not quite that simple. It's quite complex, hence the nest analogy. There are a lot of components. Things like stroma, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, pericytes, and dendritic cells. These cells all weave together to make this complex nest and tissue support structure. So Shannon, there are two ways to think about connective tissue, right? One is like a nest, as we just said, providing the support and structure to different organs. But there's also an interaction happening in how information is being transmitted and shared, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you think of a city and you think of um you know, buildings and roads and subways and, you know, different kinds of physical structures. The connective tissue would be the physical structures and then all of the people that are, that are moving around, carrying out their jobs and such inside these physical structures, those would be the specialized cells of each of your organs. So one skyscraper might be like the liver and another skyscraper might be like your adrenal gland. And there are specialized liver cells that carry out liver functions but the skyscraper, the physical structure of that building, would be the connective tissue. So the infrastructure is the connective tissue and all the people of the cells moving about being instructed by that connective tissue. Correct. And using the connective tissue to, to walk on and carry out their day-to-day -day duties on. And if you didn't have the, the floor or you didn't have the walls or you didn't have the road or the subway, then those, those individual cells, those individual people walking around couldn't carry out their function. So with the, the visual of the city in mind, 
How are the people walking about getting instructed rather than just walking randomly around the streets? Let's think about all the individual rooms within the skyscraper. So there's a floor and walls. It turns out that there's a dynamic interaction between the cells that make up the structure and then the people inside those rooms that are carrying out their specialized function. They're actually communicating with one another all the time. So the floors, the walls, the ceiling of that room are lined with factors made by the connective tissue cells that are um, instructing the, the, the tissue cells to, to do their job. How do you think or how does the field think about the different specializations of connective tissue in different places? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. We think that the connective tissue in each organ is different. And it has, um, you know, elements that are unique to each of those organs to help that organ carry out its function. And is that just because the connective tissue is made up of different cells and so there, there's a different cellularity in different tissues? Or do they actually have different functions? Probably both. And as I mentioned before, there's a dynamic interaction between the specialized tissue cells and then the connective tissue. And it's not only the connective tissue that might be giving information to the specialized tissue cells, but also there's a, uh, a return. So there's a constant interplay of communication. A constant interplay. So for example, in a liver, let's talk about hepatocytes. That's the main tissue cell in the liver that's carrying out specialized liver functions. It lives in a nest or a, a skyscraper that's created by the connective tissue and the connective tissue cells. But probably the connective tissue in the liver is different from the connective tissue in the skin because hepatocytes by nature are gonna make very different things than a skin cell, a keratinocyte is gonna make. If you take, for example, connective tissue from the skin versus the liver, and you swap the cells over, so you put the hepatocyte on the skin and the skin cell on the uh, liver connective tissue. What would that look like under a microscope? Whoa, that's... <laughs> Jane, you're way ahead of the field. <laughs> that's, that's futuristic. So I, I'd like to pivot a little bit and um, think about cancer as a disease state in tissue, especially solid tumours. When we think about tumours starting to grow, obviously they start to change the microenvironment ar around them. What are those changes and what are all the stromal cells and fibroblasts and other connective tissue changes that are going on? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. So, you know, tumours develop from individual transformed cells that start ignoring normal growth cues and they start dividing very rapidly and forming a ball of cancer cells. So this is a malignant cell. Yeah, exactly. So in these um, early malignant lesions, the cancer cells are like little factories of lots and lots of proteins and other factors that they're, that they're secreting outside themselves and into the microenvironment, into the tissue. And of course these cells, they proliferate and grow much faster than normal cells, so the amount they're producing is like a, you know, a factory on overtime. And they're making factors that help them to continue growing. So, and the factors that they're making are not only helping them in a direct manner, they're actually influencing all the cells around them in whatever tissue they're growing in to do things to help them to continue growing. It's kind of like a pathogen that's harnessing or evolving in a way so that it can, it, it's, has a, it's, it's developing selective advantages so it can grow better and not die off. So how do stromal cells, fibroblasts fit into this? Well, these are cells that are already present in the tissue, but the tumor cells begin growing in their home and start secreting all of these factors, these little factories of proteins and, and um, you know, lipids and other types of molecules that start modifying the normal tissue microenvironment. And the normal tissue microenvironment becomes dramatically changed to help support the growth of these tumor cells. So what's the yin and yang here? Is the tumor trying to um, remodel the microenvironment around itself to um, get support for its own structure? A lot like a solid organ that we were talking about earlier, just in a very micro sense. Or is it the, um, the changes that are going on in the fibroblasts and stromal cells are walling off that tumor and it's a way the body's trying to limit the tumor growth? 
There are different ways of looking at that problem. So in some ways, we think about the tumor creating an environment that helps the cells to grow and then to metastasize, leave that tissue and grow elsewhere throughout the body. But there are other points of view that suggest maybe the body is trying to wall off the tumor um, and keep it from growing. And probably both are happening. And all of those um, efforts involve changes in the tissue microenvironment. So back to immune cells. We know, and we again have talked about this in season one, that harnessing the immune system is really critical to help kill tumor cells. So the immune cells need to get to the site of the tumor so that they can do their job and try and eliminate the tumor. Once you start getting this complex matrix around the tumor, how is this communication affected? Yeah, so the body, um you know, has an immune system that's capable of recognizing new things that arrive in our tissues. So anything foreign to the body is seen by the immune system. This is one of the coolest features of the immune system. So a tumor is actually seen as foreign to the body because these are cells that have mutations that are not present in your normal tissues. So those mutations cause tumor cells to secrete molecules or express molecules that have never been seen by the body before. Jane, question about tumors in the immune system. I thought from season one they weren't recognized by the body. Like Iris said, they're not foreign. Well, yes and no. So the immune system is always capable of being turned on. So it can go in and recognize these tumors. What we were talking about in the earlier podcast was that the immune system can be actively shut down by the tumor microenvironment. And so then the tumor wins, right? So the immune cells are coming in and they want to do their thing by attacking the tumor the tumor starts turning them off and they become exhausted or quiescent, so they're sitting there silent. But they've got all the machinery to go, they just need the brakes taken off them. So the immune system starts to see the tumor much in the same way as it would see an invading viral infection or something. Yes. So there are cells that live in all of our tissues called dendritic cells. And dendritic cells are sentinels of our tissues. And they live there to basically watch for incoming, we call them antigens, but these are molecules made by foreign bodies. So either a virus, bacterium, a parasite, or a tumor. And what they do is they eat or gobble up pieces of these foreign um, objects. And they don't eat them and then digest them completely. They actually eat them and then they carry them they, they migrate out of the tissue to a lymph node. And when they get to a nearby lymph node, they use the material that they had gobbled up in their tissue of origin to alert the immune cells, the lymphocytes, that there's some unwanted object in the tissue. So not only are cells moving into the tissue, we're having cells move out. You just mentioned the dendritic cell, which is a very unique cell within the body, and I think we're still learning exactly what these cells are, how we define them and what they do, but could you describe them for us? Sure, these are cells that originate um, from the bone marrow, but they live in all of our tissues. It's called a dendritic cell because it has these very long dendrites or spines. And the spines are these very active arms, or we, or we call them in cell biology processes, that are moving all the time in their little microenvironment, and they use them to capture uh, molecules that are and, and, and debris that's in their surroundings. And what they do is then they, they pull the debris into their cell bodies and into structures called lysosomes. And in these lysosomes, they basically have all kinds of, it's a very destructive uh, environment with a lot of proteases and the low pH, it's very acidic environment, and whatever they bring in gets degraded. So it's like an acid wash. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> things get broken down into smaller things. Yeah, you can think of it as a garbage truck. So it just basically takes in these unwanted objects and breaks them down into smaller pieces. And while that's happening, the dendritic cell is also um, picking up and leaving the tissue and migrating into a lymph node. And then it the reason they do that is because most of the lymphocytes of our body accumulate in lymph nodes, and they want to alert lymphocytes to the presence of these unwanted objects. So they migrate to these lymph nodes, find lymphocytes, 
that would be um, specific for these unwanted objects that they found in the original tissue. And they turn them on. They tell them there's some kind of unwanted object in, our, in the original tissue. You need to go there and destroy it. And all of these events are happening in the context of connective tissue and of stroma and matrix and fibroblasts. So Shannon, you've worked on dendritic cells for a long time. In fact, uh, I believe when you were a student at, at Yale that this was one of the cell types that you started exploring for your, for your own research. Why the interest? So I was working in a laboratory that was um, focused on um, a specific cell biological process that seemed to be um, very active in these cells. And we were trying to understand how that cell biological process was regulated. And one thing that we came to understand in the research that I was doing in collaboration with various others in, in the lab at Yale, which was the lab of Ira Melman, but in collaboration with the lab of the Nobel Prize laureate Ralph Steinman at Rockefeller University, was what the purpose of these processes were and how they were regulated in time and in space. How did, how did this work? Two labs wanted to work together and I was actually the person that sort of functioned as the liaison between the two labs. So I was traveling back and forth from Yale to Rockefeller, often by train or by car and carrying cells and um, on, in ice boxes. This sounds uh, very complicated actually. Um, those of us that work with primary cells know how delicate they can be. How on earth were you carrying cells from one place to the other? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, we um, handled these cells with a lot of care, but one of the reasons we were doing it in the first place was that the Steinman lab was expert at isolating them um, and growing them up in you know, manipulating them, and we were learning from them how to do it initially. And so Ralph and I would actually um, meet in train stations, and he would deliver cells to us early on before we knew how to do it, and then I would bring those back to the lab at Yale, and we would carry out experiments with them. Hang on, so you're one scientist walking around with an ice chest full of cells and handing it off in a train station platform to someone else? It sounds awfully clandestine. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly how it happened. For, for me, a, a, a really important um, sort of pivot or moment, eureka moment for me, was when the folks doing intervital imaging were originally studying dendritic cell T-cell interactions in lymph nodes. They were visualizing these two cells in a lymph node in real time, which was really cool. How, how do you do this? So, you know, there, there are ways of tagging cells with different um, colors that can be detected on microscopes, specialized microscopes, and they would colorize a dendritic cell with one tag and colorize a T cell with another tag. So one green. would be red and one would be green, or one would be blue and one would be red. And then the microscopes can detect those different colors, and the microscopes can collect information in real time. And you can watch these two cells crawling around the tissues, finding each other, and then spending time together and during the formation of what we call the immunological synapse, these cells are actually talking to one another, and the dendritic cell is activating the T cell. So this is when the dendritic cell is conveying its information now to a T cell in order to prime that T cell and harness it so it can go do its job. Exactly. And for a long time, the approach focused on these two cell types. So you would see the red dendritic cell and the green T cells interacting with, with each other. And in the backdrop was black space. But then a couple of groups started realizing that we were paying attention to the dendritic cell and the T cell, of course, because as immunologists, we were immune cell centric. And we thought that everything was dictated by the interaction between these two cells. But some very clever scientists decided to illuminate the backdrop. And they did this by having a third color in the mix, which illuminated the microenvironment or the tissue or the connective tissue, the stroma, as we say. And what they realized was actually that the T cells and the dendritic cells, their movement in that tissue was following the tissue structure, the connective tissue structure. So that the rules of this interaction were not only coming from the dendritic cell and the T cell, but all the tissue around them was having a very big, playing a very big role in the outcome of the immune response. 
And that was a kind of a eureka moment, I think, for the field because it forced immunologists to start paying attention to the cells around the immune cells, to the tissue, the connective tissue, the stroma. And then we started looking in all the tissues and realizing when immune cells are crawling around any tissue, they're not crawling around in a black space or in an empty space. They're actually crawling on the connective tissue. So the structure provided by the connective tissue is dictating immune cell movement and also giving them very specific information about how to move, when to stop, how to act. What was the moment you got in science? <laughs> I loved science from a very young age. You know, as a kid, I was interested in archaeology and marine biology. I mean, most kids are interested in dolphins and whales and sharks, right? I mean, many of us who are now scientists started with an interest in marine biology. I know a number of us. Big things, were cute majoring. things, scary things. Absolutely. So I was actually a marine biology major as an undergraduate. And, um, but, you know, to be that major, I still had to take some human biology courses. And it was in, you know, the human biology courses that I started to realize how incredibly cool the human body was. And I ended up getting a job as a research technician in an immunology lab at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. And I was in a laboratory that was run by two actually well-known immunologists who took me under their wing and decided to teach me the basics of immunology. One was Dr. Susan Webb and one was Dr. Jonathan Sprint. And Jonathan Sprint took me into his office, was smoking a pipe and with his you know, very thick Australian accent started teaching me the fundamentals of immunology. And I think it was that mentoring moment that was so special to me. Um, it got me really, really excited about this new topic. I fell in love with immunology in a very similar way. I had studied biochemistry and pharmacology as an undergraduate, and my professor used to also sit in the lab smoking his cigars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got a job in a immunology uh, group at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, Australia, and again had a very one person that changed my life in that respect was Jacques Miller, um, a man who you know helped discover the role of the thymus, which is a whole other topic of discussion for another day. But um, yeah, I got super excited about what the immune system is and how it works and what we don't know, which really launched me off into my professional career as well. I think those teaching moments are really important. And, um, you know, I have always loved teaching. And I think, you know, turning, helping a student to, to see the light or get excited about a topic or understand a topic is when the lights turn on. So as you project forward five or ten years from now, where do you think we might be or where do you hope we'll be in terms of understanding more about the connective tissues and the role they play in disease? Yeah, so I think what, I think what, we're, we're, what we're coming to understand is that connective tissue in each organ is somewhat different. But I think what's more important with respect to human health and disease is that a disease state or a pathological state is going to influence the connective tissue of each organ differently. So if you have a disease like rheumatoid arthritis, the connective tissue there is changing very dramatically. We, we know quite a lot about how the connective tissue is um, evolving during the development of rheumatoid arthritis, as an example. But in liver fibrosis, the connective tissue is also very different from a healthy liver. And in order to fully understand what those changes are, we need to understand the connective tissue in the healthy tissues and compare them to one another, for example, from the liver to the, to the, to the joint. But then we need to understand what those disease states are doing to the connective tissue because I should back up and say that we know that those changes in the connective tissue are part of the reason those diseases develop in the first place. So one of the reasons we want to understand all of these complexities in the connective tissue is to hopefully intervene in the connective tissue to maybe stop some of these diseases from advancing. Do you think people are going to start treating the cells around the tumor, that connective tissue, instead of the tumor itself? I think we're definitely looking at ways of targeting the connective tissues, but it won't be instead of the tumor. It'll probably be a multi-pronged approach. We might need to go after the tumor and the immune cell and the connective tissue that's providing the structure and the signaling for all those cells. 
So the connective tissue is both the villain and the hero? Yes. Yes, so in rheumatoid arthritis, we know the connective tissue is perhaps uh, one of the major drivers for pathogenesis. So the destruction of the joint is largely driven by altered fibroblasts. There's a, c a communication between immune cells and fibroblasts that's leading to the destruction of the joint. In liver fibrosis, we know that inflammation is causing fibroblasts, connective tissue cells, to make the organ really stiff and not function well anymore. You know, in diseases like cancer, we know that the connective tissue there is also creating a structure that helps tumors to grow, but not only helps them to grow, helps tumors to be resistant to certain drug therapies, chemotherapies and immunotherapies. And so we really need to understand how these cells are doing that so that we can go back and develop therapies that will hopefully block those functions and then make those tissues either regenerate or become more responsive to the drugs that, that patients are receiving. I think this is all tremendously exciting, bringing together essentially two different fields, right? The connective tissue and structure, um, and then the immunology field. And particularly for me, I find that exciting as someone who focuses on T cells and, and immune cells, like how they get into tissues and get their instructions, particularly with disease and tumors. So I certainly look forward to more of your research and um, hope that we'll continue to collaborate on this in the future, us um, either individually or, or in the field. I look forward to that too, Jane. Thanks. What a great start to the season. Connective tissue is no longer a black space. I'm particularly looking forward to seeing how this field develops as it directly regulates some of the immune cells I work on and care so much about. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back in the bar in a couple of weeks with a new show focused entirely on proteins. I love proteins. In the meantime, keep telling your science fans about us, like us on Facebook and Twitter, and most importantly, if you haven't already, subscribe and rank us on iTunes. And now, for me, it's back to the lab. <laughs>